Okay, hello. Um, today I'll be doing some motion video <laughs> on the motion of this house would not exempt or defer individuals deemed to be nationally significant from national service, for example, BTS and Joseph Schooling. So I believe this was the DADC round two motion. Okay, so first of all, um, just some general remarks and context. Um, just to define some key terms in this debate, um, even though I think most people should be more or less familiar, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so national service, it usually lasts around 22 to 25 months in Singapore, um, 18 to 21 months in Korea and 32 months in Israel. Um, but the important thing to note here is that like, wherever it is, it tends to be a pretty long time, right? So two or three years. So it's a pretty long time um, and it's an important chunk of a person's life. Um, and it usually takes place after tertiary education. So JC, Poly are in other places, uh, high school. So it usually takes place on the last um, educational stop you make before university, if I'm not wrong. Uh, at least that's the case in Singapore. Um, and what are exemption and deferment? Um, I think exemption means that you don't have to do it at all. Um, so you never do NS, um, whereas deferment means you usually do it at a later date. So you do it at a later date, uh, typically um, when you're when your other things that are preventing you from doing NS don't matter as much anymore. So in this world, um, GAF has to defend no exemptions and deferments at all, whereas OP probably has to briefly outline how do we use exemptions or deferments. Um, secondly, um, what does nationally significant actually mean? So I think national significance probably exists on a spectrum um, where there are some like very clear-cut examples that people will go, ah, yes, definitely national significance. Um, but like there are other examples where people might like think about it for a while and question whether or not it's actually nationally significant. Um, so the clearest cut example I think is national athletes uh, because they compete under our nation's name and flag. Um, and when they win, um, they fly the nation's flag up and you play the national anthem. So very clearly they are um, like representatives of our country and when they win it brings like glory and pride both within and outside of our country. Um, so I think that's very clear cut. But I think there's also space um, as obviously alluded to in the examples they give like BDS um, that cultural icons uh, are also possibly nationally significant. Um, because even though BTS works for a private company, they don't work for the Korean government and they don't work in the direct interests of the Korean government, um, they still help Korea, right? Because the fact is they have spread the Korean language and they spread K-pop um, and Korean culture um, to the point where like people are becoming more invested in K-pop. Um, people are, become, are starting to learn the Korean language. Um, people want to visit Korea and experience its culture. Um, and that brings to it like important benefits like for example not just the direct benefit of like tourist dollars are uh, like the direct benefits of like GDP when they purchase BTS albums but also the fact that many people think about Korea in good terms many people see Korea as a friendly place and a place um, they want to protect and a place they care about and that's a kind of soft power that can be equally important and equally nationally significant um, so it's up to the debate uh, where to draw the line on like what constitutes or does not constitute nationally significant um, so what is this debate about then? Um, I think this debate is about probably two things, maybe just one thing. Um, the debate probably is about national interest, so which side best fulfills them, obviously. Um, but it's also possibly about private interest, right? I.e. Um, the interest of the person vis-a-vis -vis the national interest, which is the interest of the state and society as a whole. Um, and whether or not the, the private interest matters more or less than national interest, however you should care about it in a specific debate. Um, more on that later. But first, uh, the opposition case, um, i.e. Uh, we want deferments and we want exemptions. So how can OP win this debate? Um, I think there's two ways for OP to win this debate. Um, and I think these two ways are independent of each other. So I think it's possible to win the debate by proving either of them, but by not proving both. Uh, like you could always just prove the both and the, win the debate um, in two ways, right? But I think either of this would be sufficient to win the debate by itself. Um, I think the first way to win is that proving um, exempting or deferring these individuals is in the best interest of a nation. But I think the second and more interesting way to win, or the more principled case to win with, is to prove why in this particular case, the harm done to the individual cannot outweigh the benefit to the nation. I.e., why in this particular case, you, could care, you should care more about protecting the interests of the person rather than the interests of the nation as a whole. Um, I think in terms of policy, um, the hardline stance would be 
um, taking deferments only, so there are no complete exemptions. Um, but I think it's also possible to create a policy where you use a mix of exemptions and deferments. So you would um, exempt, you would defer uh, many people, but you exempt certain specific people um, whenever deferments don't make sense or whenever deferments are not practical. Um, so I think a reasonably logical policy on how you use exemptions and deferments could probably protect you from like the worst possible accusations coming out from prop. Um, but I don't think you should spend too much time on policy because I don't ultimately think of this about policy only. It's probably more about like the broad idea of um, whether or not national service should be exempted or deferred based on who you are. Um, so don't don't spend like your entire case with a seventh year policy or anything like that, I think. Um, so national interests, how can all prove that they better protect national interests? I think they need to prove this um, through two ways. First, by proving why the individual best fulfills national interest in all outside of NS and proving why serving NS significantly harms their ability to fulfill the national interest. So why does an individual best fulfill their national interest outside of NS rather than inside of NS? Um, I think the very obvious thing to state is simply that like the fact that they're nationally significant means they're doing something really big outside of NS where they are uniquely capable of doing that thing and where nobody else can do it. So for example, Joseph Schooling um, is a pretty fast swimmer. Um, not many people can swim as fast as him in Singapore and taking him out of the equation will probably mean a significant damage um, to the national Olympic team's chance of winning medals. Um, comparatively, um, unless you tell me that like Joseph Schooling is a um, inhumanly strong naval diver who can take out like 300 soldiers by his own, um, which is probably not the case, he's probably just going to be a regular soldier who can hold a gun and shoot a gun, then obviously his contribution and his unique individual contribution um, is a lot higher outside of NS rather than inside of NS, right? And then you probably need to impact these contributions a bit more. So like locally, it's important because for example, when your athletes win um, medals, um, when your culture or language spreads, as is the as, as is the case with like BTS or other cultural icons, um, that creates a sense of national pride, that strengthens your national identity, that makes that make people see their own nation in a favourable light and be like, yes, I want to continue to be part of this nation, I'm proud of what this nation is, I'm proud of what this nation has accomplished. And that's important for things like social cohesion, um, especially in countries, for example, that um, may require an additional dose of social cohesion, for example, Singapore. Um, at least Singapore, like, okay, Actually, yeah, just Singapore. Um, but it's also like international impacts. So um, I think raising the national flag, uh, like proving the national, uh, on an international stage grants you a lot of soft power, right? Because as already uh, previously stated with BTS and all, um, when they spread the Korean language, when they spread the Korean culture, more people care about Korea. And that's probably important uh, in putting into the mindsets of many like citizens all over the world that Korea is something that's good. Korea is something you worth to be worth to care about, right? Um, so that's a form of soft power that protects a country as well, um, compared to the hard power that is like military, that is like guns, tanks, fighter jets, etc, etc. Um, so you probably have to impact these contributions and why they're so, and how they actually help the country, right? And the second thing that's important to prove here is why serving NS significantly harms their ability to fulfill these national interests, to create these local and international impacts that we just talked about. Um, I think the Critical thing to note here is the time sensitive nature of many endeavors. So, for example, um, you need athletes like Joseph Schooling. Like, you think about that. Um, ath ath athletics is a highly competitive sport where everybody seeks to gain every little advantage that they have. The fact that a person is taken out of training at the peak of their physical form, at the peak of their physical prime, and forced to do things that are not sporting training, forced to do things that are not competing at sports. Um, means that they don't exploit the most important time of their life. And that's probably a bad thing, right? Because in like 5-10 years, they may not be able to compete at a level anymore. They may not be able to win medals anymore. Um, but even if we're not talking about like elite athletes, um, things like cultural phenomenon like BTS are also uh, time sensitive, right? Um, because the fact of the matter is that it is right now, or rather in the past few years, uh, where Korean culture and K-pop have become a lot more prevalent in um, the West than they were before, right? And you see this in things like, for example, the BTS making English-only tracks to try and like expand their reach to English-speaking people who don't want to listen to Korean, but who might listen to a BTS song in English. Um, the fact that they've appeared in like national awards are like magazines that were 
um, in the music industry in the West, they were previously only the preserve of like English speaking um, Western artists. Um, means that like they've actually penetrated into the West, um, and they've penetrated into like many music listeners and like subsequently um, the Korean language that they often sing in and the Korean culture that you often expose yourself to and um, when you search out more about BTS and like their origins etc etc is something that is like at a peak or like is a steady rise right now so the fact is it is precisely when they are rising right now and the wave they are riding is at its high tide right now where you take them out and you force them to serve NS and you force them to not be able to promote their music and make new albums that people listen to that spreads the language that spreads the culture it's probably some. Um, it's probably a pretty bad thing because it's unlikely that this thing replicates this phenomenon replicates itself again in the future. So again, it's time sensitive, and when you take them out of it at this time sensitive period, um, you you like harm their ability to contribute in a very significant way. Um, so secondly, um, individual interests. So I think even if you don't want to, um, even if you don't want to, or if you're unable to prove that you're, you better protect the national interest, you can actually probably make a principled case um, that you protect the individual interests of these people. And secondly, and more importantly, why it's important to protect the individual interests of these people um, over like broader societal or uh, state interests. <clears throat> So there's probably so the first thing you probably do here is like just the broad rhetoric that people like to throw out um when you talk about like why you shouldn't do things for the state right so it's like the idea that people don't choose to be born into a state um people never opted into the state's laws are uh, opted into obey obeying what the state wants them to do um, and similarly it's very hard to opt out of the state right for most people it's not an option to simply pack up and leave and move to a different country and choose a different state Right, so because there's no opt-in and because there's no opt-out, um, people cannot be reasonably forced um, to like conform to whatever the state wants them to do. Um, but the problem with this is that like a reasonable prop uh, will probably just point out that like yeah, so people don't choose to be born into a state, but to have a functioning society, we still need to force people to do certain things in the name of the state and in the name of society, even if they don't want to, right? So the fact is whenever a criminal commits a crime, they are acting in their private and public they are, they are acting in their private interests, right? Because you're taking money for yourself. You're protecting your own interests. But we still have to force them to care about society's interests and force them to care about the state's interests because if we didn't, then society would just break loose. So I think a more reasonable place for this debate to end up is that states um, sometimes concede that um, they cannot take away some of your private interests are like states typically balance both private interests and public interests right uh, based on a case-to-case -case basis so you, you then just need to prove why in this particular case the skills tip in favor of protecting your private interests of the athlete of the singer rather than the public interest of fulfilling ns right and i think you can make um this case with a lot of the similar arguments from beforehand um, in the previous slide right which is that you know the um, fulfillment of public interest, i.e. you doing NS, is a lot lower than the harm caused to your private interest, right? When your career is taken away, when your ability to compete when your ability to compete in your sport at your physical prime is taken away from you, the harm done to yourself is simply so much greater than the contribution you do to the nation that in, it is in this particular case that the state should care more about you than care about like society as a whole. And that's why they should prioritize your private interest. And your private interest is in not serving NS or in, de or in deferring NS, right? So I think there's a different way to win the debate and then separate way to win the debate. Um, possibly something you can put out in second speaker, uh, maybe even first speaker, depending on what you prefer, I guess, or what you think um, you can run best. But now um, that I've talked about the opposition case, um, which I've talked about first because I actually think it's the more intuitive and straightforward case, um, I'll now be talking about the proposition case where people have to serve NS. <clears throat> so how do I think prop can win this debate? Um, I think prop wins this debate by like crafting a specific story about these things. The first is that the countries that have conscription are countries that face genuine national security threats i.e. they are actually threatened by their neighbours, they are actually threatened like the existence of the nation or the ability of the people of the nation to survive is actually under threat. And that serving NS is not just about the direct manpower contribution you make to NS by being there and doing your job. Serving NS is also about creating a, a narrative of national security 
um, and that this narrative is necessary to defend against these threats. Crucially then, you have to prove that like exemptions and deferments to NS harms the, nation, the, harms the narrative surrounding national security, um, therefore harming the ability of the nation to protect itself from the national security threats um, that are breathing down their neck. Um, so why is national security so important to these states? Right? I think to answer this question, you just need to think about like what kind of nations typically tend to enforce conscription. Um, these are nations like South Korea, these are nations like Israel, these are nations like Singapore. These states are usually under a genuine national security threat. So for example, Israel is surrounded by Arab states that it has not too far back actually gone to war with. Um, South Korea still has to face like regular missile testing and like nuclear tests um, every few months or years or so where their missiles fly very close to the airspace. It's pretty threatening. Um, but I think uh, any most um, op teams would probably point out at this point that like, you know, maybe national security is not so important. We're living in an era of peace, uh, which can be disputed. But like they'll probably say we're living in an era of peace. The actual threat of invasion, uh, like troops coming over to take over Singapore, is incredibly low. So national security is not actually that important um, for many of these states anymore. I think there's two ways to respond to this. Um, the first way um, is to think about what national security actually means. So while national security is often taught of like in military terms, in terms of tanks, troops, guns, missiles, etc., etc., national security can actually be about anything that makes a nation feel insecure right because security insecurity so what's a good example of this let's think about singapore so the actual possibility of malaysia or indonesia invading singapore is pretty damn low or at least i like to believe it is very low um so that's probably not what makes us insecure but think about other ways that like Singapore can be made to feel insecure by our neighbours like Malaysia and Indonesia. Think about the fact that like a significant portion, um, I believe like like 80-90% of our food is imported and a significant portion of the import obviously comes from nearby countries like Malaysia and Indonesia. Also think about the fact that Malaysia still supplies us with a sizable portion of our water um, and they do that because they agree to <clears throat> So even though Malaysia uh, may not choose, uh, even though Malaysia is unlikely to declare war on us and invade us entirely, it is a lot more plausible that they may, for example, choose to not sell us water anymore, or they may choose to not sell us food anymore, which has recently actually become a thing with the chicken import crisis, export crisis, etc. Et so even though Malaysian troops aren't going to land on Singapore, the fact that Malaysia can take away our food or water, or the fact that Malaysia can threaten to take away our food and water, makes us as a nation insecure because we rely on these things um, to survive. And if they're taken away from us, uh, they are threatened to be taken away from us, we will feel pretty scared and insecure. So these are national security threats as well. right? So the first response is to just expand the, the gamut of what is considered national security. And if you do that, you can prove that national security is probably quite important. I mean, there's other ways to do this as well. So think about the South China Sea, think about shipping, and think about the fact that Singapore is a port city, right? Um, second way to respond to this idea of national security not being relevant in today's world anymore is to say that like, even if there's no imme immediate and direct threat of military action, the perception of security and stability is still essential to these nations, right? So think about the nations of that we're often talking about, like South Korea, Singapore, even Israel, right? They tend to be highly technologically advanced nations um, where a significant portion of their economy is driven by like their links to international trade right so peop so like this is most clearly the case in, like for example um, South Korea where many of the MNCs um, are like Samsung and they rely a lot on like exporting they rely a lot on, like connections with the outside world are in Singapore um, which acts as a finance hub which acts as a shipping hub and all of these are important things that require other people outside of the nation to care about a nation and invest in that nation and pour money into that nation the important thing then to note here is that people are only likely to work and play in your nation people are only likely to start up companies in your nation or invest in your nation if they have a good reason to believe that your nation will continue to exist tomorrow and not be invaded, or that your nation can be stable and secure, and that perception is only uniquely achieved when you have 
um, a large enough army that people believe is strong enough to deter threats, whether or not those actual threats exist. So in summary, it's about like creating the perception of security and stability that is essential to the social economic um, development of these nations and the economic growth and like investor confidence, etc. etc. Um, the second question to answer then is like how does national service guarantee national security, right? Because you may have proven at this point that national security is important, but you haven't proven why national service is important to national security. So even though that so like the first step is that obviously national service provides manpower for armed forces. But it's not simply enough to force people to serve the military. People actually have to be able have to be willing to accept military service. And I'm not just talking about the people who directly serve the military, we're talking about their families as well, right? Because even if you don't have to serve the military, because for example, you're a female in Singapore, you're probably still going to be pretty upset that, for example, your boyfriend or your son has to leave for military service and has to disappear essentially for two years. And it's a very high social cost, and it's also a very high economic cost, because it's two years of your life that you could spend making a lot more money than you would make in national service. So the state not only has to make people serve national service, they have to make people believe that national service is worth it, right? The first step is in convincing the public that a genuine security threat exists. Um, and that's all stuff I talked about uh, previously, but also, but also like people have to believe that national security is a priority. And when you prioritize national service and you make national service look important and look essential, people begin to believe that national service really is important and that, that really that a threat really does exist and that we really must defend ourselves from this threat. So like it essentially becomes like a cycle in and of itself where national service generates a belief that national security is important and that belief generates more willingness to serve and this, right? It creates basically a siege mindset. Uh, where people believe that national security is a priority, that they cannot compromise on it, and there's something worth defending. And when people believe in this, it's when people are able to accept the high social and economic cost of conscription. Um, the, the important thing then to prove here is why exemptions are deferments uniquely harm this narrative. Right? It harms the narrative of national service, therefore harming the ability of a nation to protect its national security. Right? And does this um, I think there are a few ways to do this, right? But I'm just going to introduce one, which is that it demonstrates that national security is an issue that can be traded off, right? It's an issue that can be deprioritized, it can be put into second or third priority based on the other priorities that the person is contributing to um, that grants them their exemptions are deferments, right? So again, it's not about the actual impact of one person being exempted. It's about how people will perceive it and how their perception of it will change their perception of national service and therefore their perceptions of national security as a whole right so when people see for example um joseph schooling being exempted uh, defer sure maybe joseph schooling still okay many people care about joseph schooling and they're probably happy to see it but if a larger number of national athletes are like national musicians are people of national significance begin to be exempted are deferred from ns the public will begin to question if national service is truly so important if you're truly under such an important national security threat, then how come so many people can get out of NS? How come NS can be traded off for other issues in so many cases? And that is a unique point in time where they begin to deprioritize national security. I believe the threat doesn't actually exist. I believe the threat is actually not as threatening as it actually is. Um, and when this begins, um, like people no longer believe in this stage mindset. And what, what, what are some negative outcomes of this? So what is the narrative of national service is harmed? Right, so I think on the most direct level, people become less willing to take on national service or fulfill them to the fullest extent. Right, so um, a platoon of willing soldiers is probably a lot more effective uh, and therefore a lot more contributing to the deterrent effect of a military um, than a platoon full of unwilling soldiers who will do their best to avoid doing work and who will put in the bare minimum in defending the country. Right, but it's not just about direct impacts. I, I think you also need to think like a bit long term and a bit more macro. Right, so in the long term, maybe 10, 20 years down the road, people will begin to believe national security is actually not that important. And it's when this belief spreads to a critical mass that people may, for example, want to for, um, like script NS, uh, like not script NS, but like reduce um, the length of NS, um, or like reduce the rigor of NS, which is already something that's being done, um, though whether or not that's good or bad, uh, I'm not going to comment. But basically the idea is people become less willing to do national service, people become willing, less willing to fund the military, and that's going to translate into policies 
down the line are translated into like narratives that then force the government to take on certain policies down the line and these policies and these narratives are going to harm national security in the long term and in the broader sense. So again, it's a spectrum of outcomes based on long term and short term changes. Um, and I think the important thing for OP to do here is some weighing. Right? So you need to weigh out why the reduced um, hard power, i.e. military, is more important than any soft power that OP side will gain. Right? For example, why it's more important to have a standing army that can deter your neighbours rather than have soft power on OP side where people like your country and care about your country. So it's important to do some weighing here to prove um, why these outcomes and why these impacts matter more than the impacts coming out. Um, from uh op yeah um so engagement uh as i've already talked about um there are certain paths to victory that both sides can take so like for onga our prop um you will first prove that the nations face a genuine and pressing national security threat um that national service is crucial to protecting against national security threat and that its deferments and exemptions substantially damage national service and the narratives about national service thus damaging national security so you can um, fairly clear the see the logical link here that you have to make fairly clear um comparatively on um op you have to prove that like these persons firstly contribute more to the nation outside rather than inside of ns and you need to impact why these contributions matter um, secondly, you need to prove why needing to serve NS significantly harms these important contributions they make outside of NS. So again, you see the logic here that you have to prove. Um, but the, the last thing is that even if you don't care about national interests, uh, like national contributions at all, you can also prove why these individuals' private interests deserve protection in this specific case. So there's a principal argument to be made here for protecting the private interests rather than the public state interests. Um, but let's talk a bit more about like, engagement. Uh, how um, one side would try and outframe the other the other side. So then the first thing you can do on prop um, is to heavily mitigate opposition's harms. I.e., you need to paint the picture that like NS is actually not that bad. NS actually doesn't kill a person that much, right? Because how why does it look like when a nationally significant person goes through NS? Um, the the thing is that like states are not blind. Um, if governments can recognize that a person is nationally significant before NS and the nationally significant contributions they're making outside of NS, they probably think it's important and they'll probably try to contribute or at least protect or give some concessions to protect these interests even while they're serving NS. Um, so I think, I'm not very sure to be honest, but I think um, in the Singapore military there is um, there's a program for like athletes are people who represent Singapore on the national stage um, where they are like given the ability to compete and train um, even while they're serving NS right? are, like, given some ability so like even if they can't compete actually to the full extent they can still compete actually in some capacity so like when you do this you severely mitigate a lot of opposition's harms right so it's actually not as bad opposition makes it come across it um, but the other way I think you can outframe um, opposition is by simply saying that national security is king so we don't care about all these other things national about all these other things that opposition talks about about your soft power about your <clears throat> about your cultural um about your cultural hold on the world about the private interest you don't care about all these things because the fact is the nation is under a genuine threat where if we don't defend it properly it could cease to exist tomorrow it could be threatened uh, like even if it doesn't cease to exist uh, we could come down under genuine threat people don't believe in our stability anymore people don't invest here and we lose out social economically it's therefore so crucial that we must protect our nation and create a strong narrative around national service that makes everybody care about national security makes everybody willing to serve the nation and makes people willing to fund serving the nation and it's so important that we cannot must protect it, protect it at all costs and it's the most important thing ever so that's probably one way you, you could try and outframe op. Um, comparatively, I think there are several ways also for op to try and engage and outframe um, proposition. Um, I think like so the same in the same way that like proposition has to prove that national security is the most important interest, um, and has to characterize a world where it's the most important interest. Um, I think you, again you could heavily mitigate proposition's characterization about national security and why it's actually not that important. Um, so I've already given some um, ideas about this earlier on when we talk about the fact that we're living in a relatively prosperous era, um, live in a relatively peaceful era, and like most places uh, are not considering state-to-state -state war are like actually invading other countries. Um, again here, I think the other way that op can engage is also by weighing outcomes. 
um, by saying that like, oh, you support national security too, right? Because it's not just about hard power, it's also about soft power. Um, it's also about the fact that like, um, if the nation, if more people care about your language, more people care about your culture, that makes their leaders, their political leaders, more likely to form alliances with you, maybe, in the long term, makes, makes it easier for them to move towards like greater investment, uh, like, um, like greater, uh, small solid ties with you and your country when the nation, when the nation's citizens care about you and in the long run that allows you to forge like alliances that help also similarly deter against threat and deter against national security.